right, welcome back everyone. I hope that everyone uh, had a great dialogue and in both of the breakouts, I know at the legal and privacy one, um, we had kind of just skimmed the service and probably could have kept um, going, but the discussion was great. So I hope the same was true for the technical. Um, kind of going off of that exact same thought, um, what we're now going to do is we're going to go through summaries of each of the breakout sessions. And I believe that Mike is going to kick us off with a summary of what was discussed during the technical session first. So Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, were we going to show the notes on screen? That's all right. I can give a good summary anyway. Um, so in our in our session, we focused around uh, gathering a couple different things. Number one, uh, we talked about what was going on in organizations that were uh, a part of the session and um, specifically looking at um, what they were doing with electronic consent or the lack thereof in their organization. We had some uh, some participation. Um, someone mentioned that uh, at Family Health Care, they, um, they're they very regionally uh, spread out. And so they were uh, grappling with different solutions and uh, a lot of portals that they're logging into. They they were looking for different, different uh, consent collection, especially as it relates to um, right now in their telehealth process, they were collecting verbal consent. And then the next time they see the patient in person, they're collecting a physical form. Um, we, we moved on to, to including that question and also talking about um, sharing specially protected information in, in Michigan and, um, and how that could be progressed in the state of Michigan and um, continuing to talk about current processes as well. Um, we then had somebody from the uh, District of Columbia Department of Healthcare Finance. Um, they were talking about the consent processes they're looking to put in place and they're hoping to learn from Michigan. Um, they described their scenario a little bit and we, we I talked about the one that my hens put in place. Um, then, uh, we had some uh, perspective from the uh, PIHP, the prepaid inpatient health plan perspective. Um, they described some interesting use cases for data sharing using consent that um, we were trying to think through how, how consent could be improved in their process um, that we haven't discussed before. Um, and we found some ways that possibly could eliminate extra burden collecting duplicative consent from the patient, as well as uh, possibly focusing trust on a centralized consent um, service. And we really emphasize the, the fact that it all boils down to, to trust. Um, you know, if, if you stand up this application, but everybody still wants to collect and house their thing locally, then the, the centralized service can still be used for some automated purposes. But in order for us to really start to eliminate administrative burden, eliminate patient burden, try to get reuse out of things, there has to be trust established. And that's what we're trying to do in the state of Michigan. And that was a, a central point. Um, and the last thing we talked about was um, different uh, ways that messages can handle consent. And that includes both the um, whether we send this message or not, but also the fact that um, messages can be um, broken up and have certain sections that are tagged as containing uh, or needing additional consent beyond regular uh, HIPAA. And that's specifically, you know, around fire exchange and things like that. Um, and that's really the the nature of our, our breakout session. Mike, one of the things that you mentioned was that you discussed different portals, and I know that this isn't something I touched on on my overview, but I think it's important for um, the attendees to maybe hear, and that is um, how does e-consent basically integrate with other portals, or do it, provider offices have to use the, the portal that we have kind of developed? Excellent question. So um, 
there's three modes that that you can work on work through with our our electronic consent management service. Number one is logging into our portal. Number two is our portal can be embedded, um, which is how my gateway is designed in general, is that uh, each module is built sort of self-contained and then it's embedded inside of my gateway with the idea that this thing could be uh, could be embedded in another application as well. And the third mode would be if you have your own electronic consent management process and you can collect it in your application already, um, being able to exchange that consent with us through an API. Um, so that way your application can still use what it uses natively, but then that consent can be reused. That makes sense. And then the other area that I just uh, wanted to get a little bit of insight on is one thing that you talked about was duplicative consent. Um, and this has come up in instances where a individual will fill out a paper consent form at their provider's office. Um, they may fill out another consent form a little bit um, later down the line at a different provider's office um, and have different individuals on it. So we have both uh, two dilemmas when that usually happens. Either their health information is being shared with providers that um, are no longer a part of their active care team. And then on the flip side, they might not be um, sharing their current information with their current providers. Can you talk a little bit about the link between um, the active care relationship service and our e-consent um, product as well? Yeah. Um, so the, the first part of that is, um, I'll start with the fact that the way we've designed the consent lookup, um, a patient can have multiple consent forms on file and we would reference all of them that are still in a valid time frame that have not been revoked um, and basically it's an in inclusive lookup so if you have two forms and you say my data can be shared with uh dr mike and and another, the other form says you can share data with dr shreya um, then data could be shared with both in our lookup um, that uh, there is also a mechanism to revoke any consent forms or any individual consent listed on a single form. The reason that we want to specifically support uh, multiple consent forms is mainly for the case where, like you're saying, that it's being filled out by two different provider offices, especially in the case of a third party ECMS collecting that form and they may not know that we already have one on file. They may not, you know, we can't dictate what they have or have not looked up. Um, so um, the ability to, to store and reconcile those two is the first step to that. And then with our active care relationship service, um, we already know who has relationships with who that have, have declared them with MyHin. So when someone's going to uh, complete a new form, what we do is we first pre-populate that form with people we know they have an active care relationship because they might not be thinking, oh, I have a relationship with this provider that, uh, you know, th you may be focused on one particular scenario when you're filling out the form. I know I want this data shared with this one doctor right now. Um, that as I showed in the demo, you can remove them without any difficulty, but uh, in the meantime, we're surfacing those relationships at the time the form's being filled out. Got it. Thanks so much for um, going into a bit more detail on those two questions. It looks like we don't have um, any audience questions at this time, but if um, someone has a, a thought or a comment in the future, please feel free to reach out to um, Mike, he is definitely an expert in this space, and I'm sure um, we can get you answers to anything um, that you need. So thanks, Mike. I'm now going to kind of transition over to the privacy and legal breakout session, and our um, co-facilitator, uh, Dr. Moon, is going to uh, quickly just walk through what we talked about during our session. Thanks, Shreya. 
first of all, Mike, thanks for uh, going over kind of the discussion points. I think it's really um, not only interesting, but this is becoming a more necessary conversation. And I just want to say, having been kind of a SME advisor on the ECMS project that, um, and knowing other projects that are going across the country, that uh, the project that MyHIN has around consent is actually very different because of the active care relationship um, basically their database that sits behind it. So, you know, when, when they are uh, receiving the permission, right, the preference to share or not share data um, at a provider level, it actually links it as an attribute, um, that consent preference to the relationship of the provider. And I think that it may be the first of its kind. So, um, Mike, I think you, you uh, are being a little bit too humble about what's being developed. And I'm uh, getting really excited to actually see it us. Uh, kind of uh, move into implementation. So in the discussion over on the legal uh, side, we actually um, started to hit on uh, some of these, you know, big issues, right, that are coming up um, in healthcare, uh, particularly around health data, um, around patients, right, um, owning, uh, controlling their health data, and uh, what that actually is starting to look like right out in uh, the practice. Um, so we started out really talking about necessity uh, and thinking about these new systems that are coming uh, really into, uh, I'm going to say being now, right? They're, they're kind of coming and bubbling to the top and uh, there's a disruption that's happening as new innovation, um, you know, starts to actually uh, break out. And so we were asking, you know, how beneficial would e-consent be for your uh, organization? And we had a good conversation about the fact that we still really are seeing kind of out in the ecosystem, still a mixture of both paper and electronic consent, um, and uh, even within HIEs. And so the problem is, right, with paper, um, you get kind of locally uh, the consent preference, but then you're trying to manage it across um, the system, right, the information network. And so um, really, we still are at kind of a you're all in or you're all out. And um, we haven't really quite moved over. We're, we're starting to think about granular, right, based on, you know, preference, you know, what type of data, when you want it shared, for what purpose. Uh, but we're not there yet. So um, it was a good kind of a, a, a temperature check. Um, and then we talked about, uh, you know, those conversations that happen in advanced care planning, you know, they're, they're starting to happen more in technology technological platforms, but there still are some, uh, you know, just kind of mismatches there as far as what um, the capabilities uh, are being accepted or adopted, or even whether or not they're legal, things like legally binding signature, uh, for instance. And so um, Shreya was actually able to give a couple of really good examples from uh, Michigan about digital signature and uh, virtual witness. And so we are seeing that uh, states, right, the users within the states um, are starting to really have to take a look at their legal framework and determine uh, kind of are there, uh, is there alignment, misalignment, right, of the regulation and statutes around things like wet signature versus digital signature um, on these really important documents that require um, a consent. Then we moved actually into control. And, um, you know, really e-consent contemplates uh, that there is sharing of health information at the direction of the patient or the individual or the consumer. And so we just put the question out there as far as, um, you know, patients having control of their information. Um, you know, I noted that, uh, and it's probably not surprising, I mean, there is really a large demand for access of not only more information, but how uh, consumers are able to access their information. They really, they want it on demand, you know, when they want it and for the purposes that they want it. Um, and so the discussion was really around, um, so even if you have information available that you could share, um, that some organizations are still kind of in this kind of a discussion, uh, you know, time where they're deciding whether or not they can redisclose information that was shared with them. So, you know, you're a provider, you've received information on a patient for treatment purposes. Now that patient wants that information and do you give them everything that you have on them or only the information that you collected? And I think that's a, a, a 
a very real scenario that's happening probably hundreds of thousands of times uh, every day uh, across our healthcare system. So um, we also talked about um, control um, of the record as far as, you know, what about the notes, the type of information, right? Um, and how that impacts trust, right? A provider believes that it's a very personal, confidential, um, you know, interaction, a provider with a patient and how much of their notes, for instance, should be uh, disclosed. And it's not an unfamiliar conversation. We probably have all heard it uh, a lot, but it, it's still a conversation that's happening. And uh, providers still believe that that impacts uh, trust between uh, patients and providers. Um, but I will say on the kind of the ethical principle side, you know, we are really e-consent and the conversations we're having are really starting to drive kind of new socio-technical innovation, um, both in technology and in practice. And so I think that we're going to see these new systems coming in, like Mike was talking about and describing, um, and some of the people on our breakout were describing that those are actually going to advance over time, but uh, there is going to be quite a long adoption curve, probably. Um, and really, uh, you know, that is all being, um, I'm going to say, kind of pushed uh, by the whole idea of self-determination and choice. And then the last uh, kind of questions that we talked about or, or section was really around usability, because as everyone on the call probably is familiar with that, you know, the 21st Century Cures Act is really pushing for patient access um, through electronic mechanisms like APIs, uh, application programming interfaces. And so as those APIs become uh, more available in healthcare, uh, you know, through uh, third party apps, for instance, or, you know, uh, other applications, what is uh, the actual usability of information, right? So, um, you know, should patients be able to basically on demand, you know, do a call through an API and get the most pertinent information, you know, kind of fire resources are driving us that way, right? Towards pertinent information based on the type of information. Um, but uh, is it more helpful really to give them the entire medical record? And, and is that even possible? So we heard from, uh, you know, a couple people uh, in the breakout section that, that they have whole teams that are working on usability um, of information and uh, that there is a lot of work going on. But, um, you know, in the space of kind of this on demand uh, query or, you know, response that APIs are uh, kind of bringing into healthcare, that there's still a lot of work to do because really, um, Though sometimes those APIs can make a call, but there's just that information there. Uh, there's no usable information. Um, and so uh, the other concept really that I uh, kind of brought into the conversation was, you know, all of uh, the new innovation, all of the new applications uh, really require that we have a consumer present or that consumer feedback uh, or voice uh, present in the conversation so that what we're developing um, whether it's APIs for healthcare or whether it's, um, you know, e-consent, uh, you know, applications, we really need to make sure that we're designing it for what the expectation of a consumer um, would be. Perfect. Thanks so much, Lisa, for that great um, summary. It is insane that we are able to cover all of this content in 30 minutes. So. I really appreciate you giving this overview. You're welcome. I don't think I don't think we have um, any questions from the group. Again, do feel free to reach out to either myself and Lisa if you have any questions on the legal and privacy side. Um, as is always the case with um, legal and privacy in the healthcare space, it's, and it's part of an ongoing dialogue. So I'm sure this will not be yes. um, the last time that we contemplate these questions. All right, and with that, um, we can kind of. Um, begin to close out the conference. So I just had a few um, parting thoughts that um, I wanted to relay to the audience. Um, for those of you who haven't been involved in other sessions that we've done, um, this workshop is actually a part of a five part conference series um, in which we had two bookend events. We had a kickoff in March. We did three uh, half day workshops on social determinants of health, telehealth, and now e-consent. And then we are going to have kind of our um, concluding 
session on November 9th, which is coming up. That one is going to be an all day event. Um, it's going to be heavily um, attended by external audiences, by national audiences. So that is definitely going to be a um, an event that you will not want to miss if you want to kind of continue on this dialogue and then also look into other um, topics of discussion in the HIE space. Um, also, I know that there's been a really robust uh, discussion in the chat. So I know that Mike has been in there answering some of the questions, but we'll make sure to sift through, through those and make sure that everyone gets answers um, if they had any questions or concerns on, on anything that was discussed today. Um, in addition to that, I know that we will be publishing all of the uh, slide decks, including the ones from the breakout sessions, as well as the notes um, on our MyHIN website tomorrow. So I believe that Nazi can give you a little bit more information in the chat on exactly where you'll be able to find that. Um, but everything that we've gone through, you're going to be able to reference after the fact. Thanks everyone so much for attending and, and the biggest thank you to all of our speakers for um, giving us a more detailed look into the e-consent space. Thanks everyone, have a good one.